There are just over 170 pharaohs, but there's one who stands literally head and shoulders above the others, the name that everybody knows, Ramesses II. Died an old man at around the age of 90. He had a tomb built worthy of his importance, a place that no one should or would ever be able to enter. The curse of the pharaohs isn't just ancient superstition. Scientists who opened Ramses the Great's tomb made a terrifying discovery that might explain the legendary malediction. Turns out, it's the same killer organism found in other Egyptian tombs linked to mysterious deaths. Remember how 10 of 12 people who opened King Casimir's tomb died weeks later? Or how Lord Carnarvon dropped dead after Tutankhamun's tomb was opened? Well, new studies from Harvard show these weren't curses at all. Stick around, because what you're about to hear will completely change how you see ancient history. Come along. The Legacy of Ramses the Great and His Tomb Ramses II, often known as Ramses the Great, has long been remembered as one of ancient Egypt's most powerful and celebrated rulers. Many Egyptologists from the 19th century gave him that grand title for a reason. His reign, which stretched from 1279 to 1213 BCE, lasted an astonishing 66 years, an achievement that made it the second longest rule in Egyptian history. Imagine leading an empire for over six decades, outliving enemies, advisors, and even some of one's own children. People often wondered what it must have felt like to rule for that long. During those years, Ramses II did not just hold the throne, he expanded Egypt's borders, leading successful military campaigns against the Hittites and Libyans, and ensuring that Egypt stood as a formidable power in the ancient world. He was born around 1303 BCE and became pharaoh at the young age of 25. That alone sounded remarkable, how many people could take charge of an entire empire at that age. But what truly set Ramses apart was not just his skill in war, but his obsession with creation and legacy. He had an unmatched passion for building. Some said he seemed determined to carve his name into every stone of Egypt, as if he wanted the world to never forget him. He ordered the construction of a new capital city, Pi Ramesses, in the Nile Delta, across the country. He filled the landscape with magnificent monuments, like the Grand Ramesseum in Thebes and the breathtaking temples of Abu Simbel, which still leave visitors speechless today. His funerary temple was not just a place of worship, but a center of knowledge, containing a vast library said to have held about 10,000 papyrus scrolls. That number alone gave a glimpse into the kind of ruler he was, one who valued both power and intellect. Even after his death, Ramses II's influence echoed through the ages. Nine later pharaohs took his name, hoping to borrow some of his glory, and his subjects once affectionately called him Sese. To be linked with him, even long after he was gone, was considered an honor. Wasn't that the dream of every great ruler? To be remembered not just for years, but for centuries? Ramses achieved exactly that. His tomb, like his life, carried stories of grandeur and mystery. Known as KV-7 in the Valley of the Kings, it was built during the early years of his reign. Yet, despite its scale and beauty, the tomb's location turned out to be a poor choice. It rested in a low, rocky mound, an area easily exposed to flash floods. It almost felt ironic that a man who conquered lands and built massive temples could not conquer nature itself. Over time, floods damaged parts of the tomb, but that was not the only challenge it faced. There were attempts by tomb robbers to break in, and one such incident was recorded in an ancient document called the Strike Papyrus during the 29th year of Ramses III's reign. To protect the mummy of Ramses II from further harm, priests decided to move it first to the tomb of his father, Seti I, KV-17, and later to a hidden royal cache known as DB-320. That decision turned out to be a blessing in disguise. It saved the pharaoh's body and concealed his treasures from looters for centuries. Who could have predicted that the act of hiding him would keep his story safe for thousands of years? Centuries rolled by and Ramses II's tomb slipped into obscurity. But the past has a strange way of resurfacing. During the Greco-Roman period, travelers stumbled upon it again, leaving behind graffiti on its walls as proof of their visit. Then, in 1817, Henry Salt, the British consul in Egypt, led the first known excavation of the site. It was only partial, 
but it marked the beginning of a long and fascinating rediscovery. A few years later, in 1829, the French Tuscan expedition, led by the famed scholar Jean-Francois Champollion, continued the work. Though debris made progress difficult, they managed to clear sections of the tomb and document what they found. It was like slowly waking an ancient world from its slumber. In 1844 and 1845, the German Egyptologist Richard Lepsius made significant progress by creating the first accurate plan of the tomb after managing to navigate through its accessible chambers. Yet, the tomb still held secrets deep within. It wasn't until the early 20th century, between 1913 and 1921, that more detailed excavations took place. Theodore Davis and Howard Carter, who would later become world famous for discovering Tutankhamun's tomb, uncovered fragments of royal funerary furniture believed to have belonged to Ramses II. Today, those precious pieces are preserved in institutions like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the British Museum in London. The story of Ramses II's tomb is not just about a king's resting place, it is about time, memory and the lengths humanity will go to remember greatness. His monuments still stand as a reminder of his ambition, his leadership and his desire to leave behind something that could outlive him. After all, what drives a person to build so much, to conquer so many lands and to leave such an indelible mark on history? Maybe Ramses II knew something most of us still can't fully grasp, that a person's life isn't truly measured by how many years they live, but by how long their story echoes after they're gone. And his story? It didn't end when his heart stopped beating. In fact, what happened after his death might just be more haunting than the life he lived. Because when his tomb was finally opened thousands of years later, something unexpected and deeply unsettling followed. Stay with me till the very end, because what came next left even scientists trembling the terrifying aftermath of the tomb opening. Shortly after archaeologists unsealed the ancient Egyptian tombs, strange things began to happen, and soon the whole world was talking about what they called the mummy's curse. It started as a whisper among the excavation teams and scientists, but it quickly grew into a wave of fascination, fear, and confusion that spread far beyond Egypt. People wondered if there really was something dark and mysterious guarding the ancient tombs, or if it was all just coincidence and human imagination running wild. Could a curse really survive for thousands of years, waiting patiently for the moment someone dared to disturb it? The story seemed too strange to be real, yet too detailed to be ignored. One of the most chilling accounts came from filmmaker and Egyptologist Romy Romani, who shared what he went through while filming for Discovery Channel's Mummies Unwrapped in 2019. According to Romani, the moment he entered a tomb that had been sealed for around six centuries, he began to feel something was not right. Within hours, his body reacted in ways he couldn't explain. By the next morning, he had a dangerously high fever of 107 degrees Fahrenheit, began coughing up blood, and even started hallucinating. Doctors rushed to treat him, giving him strong antibiotics as they suspected he had been exposed to some kind of ancient bacteria or pathogens from bats, snakes, or even the old dust inside the tomb. He recovered after four long days, but the experience left him shaken. He said he could never forget the feeling that something inside that tomb had almost taken his life. Was it a medical mystery? Or had he brushed against something far older and more powerful than science could explain? But Romani's story wasn't the first to spark questions about a deadly curse. The most famous case was that of Lord Carnarvon, the wealthy man who funded the excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb. Just five months after the tomb was opened, Carnarvon died suddenly from blood poisoning that began with a simple mosquito bite. At first, it seemed like an unfortunate accident, but then rumors began to swirl. People whispered that when he died, all the lights in Cairo mysteriously went out at the exact same moment. Whether true or not, the coincidence added fuel to the fire. It got people wondering, was it really bad luck? Or was something else at play? Stories began to spread like wildfire. Even powerful figures like Benito Mussolini were reportedly unnerved. After hearing about the curse, Mussolini is said to have immediately ordered that an Egyptian mummy he had received as a gift 
be removed from his home. He didn't want to take any chances. And then there was Sir Bruce Ingram, a man who was given a paperweight made from a mummified hand. The hand, according to reports, was inscribed with the chilling words, Cursed be he who moves my body. Not long after, his house caught fire. He rebuilt it, only for it to be destroyed again, this time by a flood. Could so many misfortunes really be coincidences? Or was the curse somehow following anyone who dared to disturb the ancient dead? The newspapers, of course, loved it. They printed headline after headline, filling their pages with tales of mysterious deaths and ghostly warnings. It was the perfect story. A mix of history, danger, and superstition. Reporters began to invent curse inscriptions, claiming they had been found written on the tomb walls. One article even quoted a supposed inscription that read, I will kill all of those who cross this threshold into the sacred precincts of the royal king who lives forever. Another paper claimed a translation warned, They who enter this sacred tomb shall swiftly be visited by the wings of death. None of these were real, but they sounded convincing enough to send shivers down readers' spines. After all, how could ordinary people know what was true and what wasn't? Even respected figures joined in on the speculation. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, suggested that elementals, mystical forces created by the priests of Tutankhamun, might be protecting the tomb. Coming from such a famous writer, his words carried weight. Soon, people who had collected Egyptian artifacts in their homes began to panic. Many started donating their treasures to museums, worried they might be the next victims of the curse. Who could blame them? If even powerful men were falling ill or dying, who was safe? Over time, scientists tried to offer logical explanations. They said the illnesses could have been caused by toxic mold, ancient bacteria, or harmful gases sealed within the tombs for centuries. It made sense, but it didn't stop people from wondering. Could mold really explain all those strange coincidences? Could science truly account for the eerie timing of the deaths, the illnesses, the power outages, and the panic that followed? The so-called mummy's curse became a global obsession, a story that blurred the line between myth and reality. It was retold in countless books, movies, and documentaries, each adding its own twist. People were drawn to it not just because it was frightening, but because it touched something deeper. It reminded them that no matter how advanced or rational the world becomes, there are still mysteries that make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. In the end, whether one believes in the curse or not, it's hard to ignore how perfectly everything seemed to align. The illnesses, the deaths, the rumors, and the media frenzy. It all worked together to create one of the most enduring legends in modern history. And perhaps that's what makes it so haunting. It's not just the tragedy itself, but that lingering thought none of us can quite shake off. What if the whispers were right? What if there really was a curse lurking behind it all, waiting to strike again? That single question has fueled decades of obsession, fear, and speculation. Some call it superstition. Others say there's something science can't fully explain. But before you decide which side you're on, keep watching till the very end, because the theories you're about to hear might just change how you see this curse forever. Scientific theories behind the curse. People often imagined that the so-called curse of the pharaohs came from some supernatural force, but scientists have long explained that the real danger in Egyptian tombs is far more ordinary and perhaps even more terrifying because it's invisible. The danger doesn't come from ancient spells or angry spirits, but from tiny, living things that have survived for thousands of years, waiting quietly in the dark. How could something so small be so deadly? That's the question researchers began asking when archaeologists started falling ill after opening sealed tombs. It wasn't magic at all, but biology. Over the years, scientists discovered that many of these mysterious deaths were linked to microscopic organisms. They found that ancient tombs weren't just burial chambers, they were time capsules filled with hidden life. Inside, fungi like Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus niger thrived in the still, sealed air. These molds, which were later found in both King Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt and Casimir IV's tomb in Poland, can be shockingly dangerous. In healthy people, they might only cause sneezing or nasal irritation, 
but in those with weaker immune systems, these fungal spores can do far more harm, triggering severe allergic reactions or even deadly lung infections. Imagine opening a tomb after thousands of years, thinking you're uncovering history, but instead inhaling something that could stop your breathing altogether. The thought alone is haunting. What made these fungi so terrifying was their ability to wait. Scientists explain that Aspergillus flavus produces spores that can lie dormant for centuries, sealed inside tombs without losing their power. It's as if time itself stood still for them. When the tombs were finally opened and fresh air rushed in, those spores came to life again, ready to float into the lungs of anyone nearby. Some experts believe that these ancient molds were directly responsible for the strange, sudden illnesses that struck several scientists and archaeologists who entered these tombs. Could it be that the curse was really just nature's quiet revenge? But fungi weren't the only danger lurking in the darkness. Inside some sarcophagi, researchers detected toxic gases like ammonia, formaldehyde, and hydrogen sulfide. These gases, trapped for millennia, could easily irritate the eyes and lungs or cause pneumonia like symptoms when inhaled. In high enough concentrations, they could even kill. The scientists realized that these substances were byproducts of decomposition, gases created naturally by decaying organic materials. Still, when trapped in a sealed space for thousands of years, they built up to dangerous levels. Some even wondered how many explorers unknowingly took their last breath inhaling these fumes. And then there were the bacteria. Tomb walls often carried microbes like Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus, the same kinds of bacteria that cause infections today. Under the right conditions, these could grow and multiply, turning a tomb into a silent breeding ground for disease. Who would have thought that ancient walls could harbor such modern dangers? Another silent threat came from a disease called histoplasmosis, known among researchers as cave disease. It's caused by a fungus called histoplasma capsulatum, which thrives in bat droppings. As strange as it sounds, bats often found their way into ancient tombs, especially ones partially open to the outside world. Their droppings accumulated over time, and when disturbed during excavations, they released fungal spores into the air. When breathed in, these spores attacked the lungs, sometimes causing mild flu-like symptoms, but occasionally leading to fatal respiratory infections. The symptoms didn't appear right away. They often took more than a week to show, so archaeologists sometimes didn't even realize that the tomb visit was what made them sick. Could anything be more ironic than being undone by something as ordinary as bat droppings after surviving the hazards of an archaeological dig? What fascinated scientists the most, however, was how tombs managed to preserve these organisms for so long. They explained that sealed tombs acted like perfect biological preservation chambers, miniature ecosystems frozen in time. One researcher described them as little time capsules, sealed with salts that locked everything inside, from microbes to gases. When a tomb like King Tutankhamun's was hurriedly sealed, the paint on the walls might have still been damp. That moisture, along with the food offerings and organic materials buried with the pharaoh, created the perfect breeding ground for microbes. Over centuries, as the tomb dried out, it didn't kill them. It merely put them to sleep. And so they waited patiently for thousands of years, preserved in silence until the day the modern world came knocking. So when people talk about the curse of the pharaohs, scientists suggest that perhaps there was never a curse at all. The true story might be even more unsettling. Nature itself, sealed in stone, quietly enduring the passage of time. Isn't it almost poetic? The ancient Egyptians built their tombs to protect their dead from decay, and in doing so, they accidentally preserved the very things that could harm the living. With this, we have come to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, do well to like, comment, and subscribe for more content. To enjoy more thrilling stories, click now on the following video that pops up on your screen.